Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Tuesday, October 10th, 2017 edition of VR News. Let's start things off with uh, some not too surprising news, I think. Most of us had an idea that this was in the pipeline. Talking, of course, about Nokia and their Ozo VR brand, which they completely shut down today. You had to have a feeling this was, remember, a camera that launched at 60,000 US dollars for a market segment that, let's be honest here, directors and Hollywood people and even large scale indie production companies, they weren't exactly queued up for waiting in line, pre ordering the Ozo. In fact, the Ozo pre order went up to mostly crickets, there was not a lot of fanfare. They then had their initial price cut. Remember, this was a $15,000 slash almost right off the bat. A further price cut, and it was that last price cut, really to under half of what it launched at, that for me kind of signaled the end. And well, Nokia confirming that today with an official statement that reads as follows. In digital media, the slower than expected development of the VR market means that Nokia technology plans to reduce investments and focus more on technology licensing opportunities. They did want to reassure existing Ozo consumers who've purchased the unit that they will continue to be supported. Not sure if that's uh, much consolation at this point, but uh, good to hear. And next up, uh, you know, not that I want to continue a string of, of, of grim news. Again, I think this would be firmly in the category of we saw it coming. But if we wanted further proof that Microsoft was driving a wedge between the Xbox One and virtual reality support over on the Windows sign of things, well, today was that final sign. Albert Pinello, Senior Director of Product Management and Planning at Microsoft, telling Wired in a recent interview, we learned with Connect in the Wii that just translating a typical game experience to VR is not a winning strategy. It's the oddball VR specific stuff that makes it sing. It wasn't something we wanted to distract developers with this year. He added, but VR has so much potential. Is it a viable consumer product for a certain size of audience? Clearly, Microsoft thinking that audience, at least as far as Xbox One is concerned, does not exist on the console side of things. Well, again, not sure that we didn't see this coming. We pretty much saw the signs recently, especially at E3, that Xbox One virtual reality, simply not going to be a focus for that console. And next up, we have some updated concept art and some additional details on the locomotion system that 4A Games is taking with Arctica. Now, of course, this is just ahead of the launch. The concept art looks fantastic, and they get into a, a description of why they've decided to go with a lot of single-handed weapons. They originally looked at stuff like dual wielding and non-ranged combat, but ultimately decided on a set of 10 single-hand ranged weapons that they decided to go with. And what you see are a lot of sleek lines and a lot of varying capabilities. Initially, and this is their words, a lot of the weapon design was based on coming up with different ideas that were fun to hold and fun to use, like the carver weapon, which can carve bullets around enemy cover. Definitely one of the shiny examples of how we want to make things different. Now, they also get into a bit of a discussion on their locomotion system. Remember, they have stated that they're going to be teleport only. Well, they're trying to clarify that a little bit, uh, obviously, you know, they're realizing that there's a little bit of an uproar out there with regards to their choice of locomotion because a lot of companies have opted to go for both forms of locomotion. The exception seems to be when they tie their gameplay style to teleportation and can make a good case for it. Well, 
even raw data ultimately went for smooth locomotion. And while I personally preferred the teleportation for that game, smooth locomotion by far my preferred method of locomotion for a lot of other games. But with Arctica, you can see they want to get the point across that it's not your standard teleportation. So how they explain that is they've got a node system and you basically teleport to a node and then you've got what they're basically describing as limited room scale. You can take cover. You've got tracking capability that will allow you to take cover, take a step here, take a step there, but they don't really clarify. And really, we're not gonna know until we see some form of gameplay analysis, reviews, uh, let's plays, etc. Once we see that hands-on, we'll get a sense of whether this is strictly teleportation as we've gotten used to it or a bit of a hybrid of both. To me, it still sounds like teleportation. No matter how you slice and dice it, we'll have to wait to see. And during today's Windows Developer Day, Microsoft launching the Windows 10 Fall Creator Update SDK. So of course they're gonna launch the fourth major update to Windows, the Fall Creators Update next week, exactly seven days from now, October 17th. This SDK being launched ahead of that, I get that they're launching it a week ahead, you know, but if the idea is to stock up the store with apps and games, other than the ports, we haven't heard of a lot of stuff, at least not original works or native games and applications. Maybe they've been working on this stuff behind the scenes and the SDK is gonna allow them to put the finishing touches on. I'm not so confident of that. Uh, personally, I think the cupboards are gonna be pretty bare at launch, but uh, we'll find out in about a week. And our last story, nice gesture from the folks at Oculus. Just prior to their Connect 4 event, they have decided to open source their DK2 unit. Now, you'll remember they did the same thing with DK1. Their DK2 unit sold roughly 120,000 units worldwide. They're putting the schematics, the board layout, the CAD, surrounding the mechanical aspects of the device, some artwork and some other miscellaneous stuff, all under a Creative Commons 4.0 attribution license. They're also including the firmware, but not under the same license. There's gonna be some additional limitations, but the firmware with those limitations still available. Either way, nice gesture. I don't know how valuable or important that work's gonna be. What's interesting though, is when you see some of the names attributed to the various aspects of the DK2, you realize even though, you know, you got the Palmer Lucky names getting thrown around a lot, when you realize the engineers actually involved in these different areas, it's pretty damn diverse. That'll be interesting to see where the community goes with this. If anything comes out of this, haven't seen a lot come out of the DK1 work, but that was a much lower resolution, a lot more primitive. This one closer to the units that we actually have on the market right now. Let me know what your guys' thoughts are on that. Interested to hear what you guys think. Well, guys, that is it for the Tuesday edition of VR News. Hopefully you guys are having a good evening. Putting the finishing touches on the editing for episode two of virtual reality A to Z. We're gonna look at the Sensorama. We're gonna look at stereoscopy a little bit from the Victorian age to the present. Some interesting stuff in there and how it ties into VR. Can't wait to launch that. Guys, hope you have a fantastic evening and we'll catch you for tomorrow's edition. Cheers.